Welcome back to Biggest Little Victory. This is our interview with Pastor Lewis. It's part two of what we had last week. And uh, we're really excited to share this with you because this week you're getting a double episode feature. It'll be what you're listening to now was or has been put up on Monday. And then you're going to get into one on Wednesday from yesterday's or from Sunday's sermon. So we are really excited that we get to add even more content to your life. But we just had such a fun time talking with Lewis last time. So we wanted to expand that again to a second one just to further dive into the verses that we had covered last time because there was three verses and there was just so much that we were talking about. We wanted to make sure that we covered everything that we could. So we are welcoming Lewis back on. But again, we have just a few announcements. Kendra, if you could share those, what would those announcements be? All righty, everybody. As per usual, like us on Facebook, like us on Victory Christian Fellowship. Sorry, it's so early in the morning, guys. Like us on Facebook at Victory Christian Fellowship. Follow us on Instagram at BCF Reno. Like us on YouTube at BCF Reno. Or follow the podcast on Twitter at ELB. Uh, we have a plethora of Zoom meetings that you can join throughout the week every morning at 8 a.m., every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 5.30, every night at 6 and fellowship with the men at nine o'clock every Saturday morning. And then we are on Facebook every night at seven thirty with live devotionals or a sermon type message. And that's that. Awesome. Well, uh, we're just going to go ahead and launch right into it. We don't have any excerpt to play because we already did that last podcast. So if you missed that, then crazy you, you need to go and check that out first because this is part two. Why would you listen to part two before you listen to part one? That's just crazy talk. So we're going to get started into the verses that we covered last week. Um, they were Two of them were in Isaiah. One of them was in Peter. Uh, we're not going to read those again. If you want to read them, we will reference them here so you can go check those out again. But we are actually just going to launch right into the discussion. So who wants to start us off? I'm just going to open that up. I can start off. And oh, good morning. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm, I'll start us off with uh, Isaiah. And uh, yes, I was hoping you'd say Isaiah. <laughs> couple Which of, Isaiah? Uh, sorry, six. Isaiah six. Yes, even better. We're on the same brain wavelength. Okay. We're saying brain wavelength. <laughs> um, there's it's couple... really early in the morning, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> There's, a, there's just a couple of things that I want to talk about, uh, a few things with uh, Isaiah 6 that I really, really like. Um, now, and it, when, it, when it comes to this, uh, to this chapter, you have to think at this time, Isaiah is pretty, he's pretty down in the dumps. And I know, like, uh, you don't really read Isaiah 6 like that, but this is at a time where he was, uh, he was having very little success in his ministry and he he's actually like in a in the process of like you know oh i'm just going to give up and he, he he just felt really crummy about it um and and i think that really hits me hard because i think you know as a pastor and and and, and pastor kendra you're going to feel like this eventually too so i apologize that you will just <laughs> move past it but I know personally, I have, I have just, you know, I've felt so low uh, in ministry that I'm like, you know what? There's plenty of people that want to be pastors. There's plenty of people that want to talk about God. And like, I, you know, maybe I should just quit, go get an office job and not do it anymore. And <clears throat> uh, we, there's been many times, though, where God's like, hey, stop being a big dummy and he's put these uh, this this stuff in my life where he's like, all right, this is this is where you're supposed to do some ministry now. Go do it, you know. And then I have to think to myself, okay, God, you know, send me, you know. But it's 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 I've had those times in my life where I just like I wanted to quit, um, whether it's you know somebody being completely mean to me or <laughs> or just anything like any of the negative where I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm not doing, uh, or I don't feel like I'm doing a good job. Um, I've just wanted to, to give up. And, and that's where Isaiah is in the, in chapter six, but he, at this point, and that, but he sits there and he's like, all right, God is needing somebody. So he's like, 
I will do it. I will do it and I'll do it to the best of my capabilities. And that's really what it boils down to. It's like us pastors aren't going to, we're not going to be able to bring everybody to Christ. And that is a, that's a hard hit when you think about it. Um, but there are just some people who, who are so against it, never want to, never want to, you know, even consider it. But like I said, in the last podcast, we're out here to plant seeds, not take already grown fields and then make them better. <laughs> I mean, we're supposed to make Christians better. Don't get me wrong. But our whole our whole deal is to plant the seed of Christ and and pray that it grows. Um, so that's that's one thing. And then uh, one th- one thing that I always find fascinating is when and this has not this isn't really anything to do with chapter six but uh when, every time i see holy 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 i just love that so much and it's always in threes and we you know we uh we love and celebrate the triune god you know the father son holy spirit and it's holy 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 is men- always mentioned in threes for some reason (laughs) so i think that's kind of neat and that's just a little side fact fun tidbit but that's kind of my idea of chapter six i think it i think it has to do with probably the trinity yeah Uh, yeah i think everything i've ever read it kind of agrees with that but i always like i would i just for some reason i you know i just really love i love it it you know it's one of those just powerful you every anytime you hear holy 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 you just know it's like there's something big there. Yeah, I always so, heard that it was in, in line with perfection, that it was the Hebrew idea of perfection was that it was in, in threes, that when you say it three times. Um, so it's saying holy, holy, holy is to say that God is perfectly holy. And it's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, Isaiah chapter 6 quickly became one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible once um, Pastor David read it. And like I said last time, I was really upset when he paraphrased the end because I think the ending is way more powerful. <laughs> I knew I knew you were still salty about that. <laughs> I am salty about that, and but you know what? I gotta get over it. I'm not Pastor David, and he does what he wants apparently. Oh, speaking of that, a little tidbit: he's shaving his head on live Facebook today at noon. So after, <laughs> by the time everybody hears this, it'll already be done. But you two, make sure you watch that because my dad is like attached to his hair and he's doing it for Darren. So it's like this huge thing. But anyway, like he's going, he's going bald. So yeah, he's yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, he, he, yeah, he's uh, shaving his head on live Facebook at, at noon today. <laughs> oh, too bad for our <laughs> listeners that are, uh, you're not going to see that. <laughs> By the time uh, yeah, anyone hears no, this podcast, um, it's over. <laughs> We should yeah, have. He made the mistake of making a family group chat about it, and it got it got gnarly. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so back to Isaiah six. Um, I think I just think it speaks to um, how how easy it is to be forgiven, kind of. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because um, you know he says, "Woe to me! I am ruined, for I am man of unclean lips, and live among live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord." God the Lord Almighty. So we all have unclean lips. I think we're all pretty guilty of that, right? Oh, yeah. So they come and the seraphims come and they touch the cold to his lips, you know, they basically say, you've been cleansed. And I mean, it's that simple. That's that's all you got to do is that realize it's that simple. You know, you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to say, I, I have sinned, I am unclean. And then you are clean again. And that's just amazing to me, you know, because, he was he was more than willing to just die right there, you know. Take me, I'm done. And they're like, no, we're not done with you yet, though. So <laughs> I think I think that that's a I think that's a really powerful, and it's something that we should all live by. Is that it's okay to slip up sometimes because it's also it's just as easy to get back up, brush yourself off, and pick up where you left off as long as it's down the right path. Yeah, for sure. You know, I think uh, one thing we just have to remember is like, we're, we're, you know, we as Christians, all Christians, not just pastors are called to, you know, preach the gospel and it's not easy. And, uh, we're, you know, 
a pretty hated group. Um, it's just, you know, we got to look past uh, any personal um, doubts that we have and just do just do what God says. Because I think a lot of my problem is, is like, I've wanted to, uh, you know, bring people to the Lord so bad. It's like, but am I, li am I really listening to the way God is telling me to do this? Or am I doing this on my own uh, uh, and just doing it out of like what I think is right? And that's that that'll get you. That'll get you sometimes. Yeah, that's what I've well, always we also heard. Live by the stigma. Go ahead, Stephen. No, no, sorry, you were already, you were in the middle of talking. Go ahead. No, I, I was just saying that. I was just saying that we kind of live by the stigma where people hear like, "Oh, you're a pastor, so you must be perfect." Oh right. yeah. Oh, and so many. Yeah. <laughs> and it's that's not at all how it is. We're pastors because we're imperfect. We're pastors because we're able to share your imperfections with you. And I think that non-Christians look at us that way. And that's rough because it's, you know, they, 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 they need us and they have this automatic assumption that we're perfect. And then once we do something unperfect, they like stick their nose up at us. That's ridiculous. Oh yeah. I can get into a whole thing about it. Well, I mean, since we're on that topic of, you know, uh, you know, why don't we just go to second Peter if you guys are ready to move? Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, no it's a great it's a great i mean is there any is there anything that you wanted to insert about isaiah 6 oh uh, well just briefly it was just thinking about so on um, some of those other points that you'd made like yeah, i've heard multiple pastors talk about how they are reluctant to tell people that they're pastors not because they're ashamed of being one but because it changes how people act around them you know they just want to have on authentic real relationships with people but the second they say oh but by the way i'm a pastor then all of a sudden everybody was like, oh, okay, well, I'll try, I'll try to watch my mouth from now on. Or they don't invite them to do fun, the same things anymore because, oh, do, do pastors do that? Is that okay for pastors to do? You know, so they start acting differently and weird and kind of closed off. And so I've just heard that from a lot of pastors that I don't like to have to tell people that I'm a pastor because immediately I don't get to hang out with my friends as much and I miss out on actually getting to know them because they're so afraid of offending me that they they just choose to remain silent and um like just leading right into that with like being a pastor too and the whole burden of teaching others especially because the words of jesus are pretty harsh about people who teach wrongly out of the bible you know that you make them twice the sons of hell that you are you know and that um and then according to james you know that we're going to be held even more accountable for what we do than uh, than just the people that we teach because we're the ones who are actually telling people these falsehoods. So it's, it's, uh, I've definitely felt that in the, the category of how do I be confident in what I'm doing and confident and comfortable in what I'm doing? Because kind of like what you said, Lewis, is that there's already other people doing it and they're probably doing a better job than me anyway. So why bother? <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of this uh, defeatist mentality that you just, decide to give up before you even start. And I think that's really hard for pastors, one, to have that energy, that drive to do what they're doing and to feel good about what they're doing and to feel confident about what they're doing, uh, especially in the light of the weight of the gospel, the weight of the truth, and then also navigating people telling them that, you know, well, I don't want to do this around you because you might be offended or, you know, not inviting right. them to things anymore. Right. You know, I, and it's funny because... I, I, no, sorry, go on. <laughs> no, it's hard when you're not face-to-face because -face, you can tell if someone's about to talk and now you can't tell. So, go ahead. <laughs> hey, it's, you know, I've got uh, a lot of friends that actually... I mean, some would still invite me out places because they just knew me, but there was times where it's like, oh, well, we didn't invite you. We didn't think you would want to come out to a bar. It's like, just because I don't sit there and get drunk or drink... It's like, doesn't mean I don't want to hang out with my friends. Plus, most of my friends are hilarious when they're drinking. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I don't live a certain lifestyle, doesn't mean I don't want to hang out with you or, ha you know, be your friend. Uh, you know, so it's like, it is, it is hard, you know, being, being a pastor and, 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 well, quite frankly, hard being a Christian. Because, I mean, even Christians are, you know, we're just looked at like, like, like you said, like we're goody goodies and we're all perfect. And that is like, 
the farthest from the truth. It's like we we turn to God and because we're not perfect. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> but, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> Kendra is perfect, so no one bash her. <laughs> <laughs> that is very far from the truth. <laughs> oh my gosh! But I mean, I just it just refers back to my very favorite Bible verse, Galatians chapter one, verse ten. Where he says, I'm not trying, I'm not here for you. Peter says, I'm not here for you. I'm here for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ with me here. I'm, you know, I'm not trying to please people. I'm trying to please God. Right. And that's what, that's, that's, I had, because I had to get canceled on it. I had uh, Pastor Tiffany when I stopped getting invited to things, you know, where my softball, my softball people were like, well, Kendra can't come out with us afterwards because she's a pastor now. I'm like, that's not how it works, but yes, okay. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, that's not even remotely true. I would be happy to come out with you guys. <laughs> Please don't categorize right? me before I tell you what I'm comfortable or not comfortable and it's, with. And it's, I'll let you know. Right, and and it's not even just pastors. It's you know just laymen Christians who are upfront about their Christianity. You know, so I mean we're just we're saying it like it's just pastors, but it's not. So um, because I know that like people stray away from Christianity because they feel like they need to be perfect and right. That's not at all what we're trying to convey here. You know, we're an imperfect group of people who rejoice in our imperfections together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's about building each other up, too. I mean, and that should be the same with any community or any group of people that you should be all trying to build each other up because that's the only way that humanity is going to improve is if we treat others better than they deserve and build each other up. But to say that we are already on this perfect plane is, yeah, it's a completely false characterization. And probably one of the most frustrating things about being a Christian, honestly, is when you tell other people that, and like, oh, I see, holier than thou, are you? You know, and they just kind of start to avoid you or think things of you before they even give you a chance. And uh, yeah, that's it's definitely one of the most frustrating parts. But how cool when you get to show that you're not a goody goody, you know, that you're not better than them, that you're just one of them. You just happen to believe differently. I think that's, that's the, my favorite part. So it's like, it's frustrating at first because they have that assumption about you, but then when you get the chance to actually just show them, no, this is just, I'm just a regular guy, just like you, you know, I think that's the best right. part. Yep. We just, uh, we answer a different call. That's all it boils down to. Yep. Um, uh, what I was going to say about second oh. Peter when, when it comes to the whole, you know, not feeling good enough for the call and am I doing this this whole thing right? <clears throat> One of my favorites from Second Peter, and yes, I have my Bible in front of me. I'm not, I don't know this from memory, but it's one of my favorites. <clears throat> it's in it's, uh, Second Peter uh, 1, 3. It says, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and good, uh, uh, godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. And I love that because, I, I mean, that's probably going to be my go-to verse every time I feel down about myself in ministry. It, really, God has, if, you know, God calls us to ministry um, and, and specific people to be pastors. Um, and he literally does give us everything we need for life and to live a, a, you know, a life of godliness uh, through his knowledge. If we just uh, put down our pride or our depression about it or our fears and worries about you know, going into ministry, um, God will provide. I mean, he provided for Moses. He provided for Abraham. He provided the, all the knowledge for all the prophets and minor prophets. Like he gave all of those people. He provided for David. He put, I mean, the dude provides. <laughs> that sounded like the dude abides. From. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that. <laughs> God, God provides everything we need and will ever need and have ever needed. Um, if we just look to God, pray about it, the answers are there. The answers are in this great book that we call the Holy Bible. Um, but we just, I, I know personally, I, I, I'm going to preach this, and I know there's going to be a time where I'm like, oh, man, maybe this isn't where I need to be. I, but if I, you know, if we and I, if I go to this book 
it will give me all the answers I need, you know? So I think that's one of my favorite, <clears throat> my, it's not a new verse, obviously, but <laughs> one of my favorite that I most recently got reacquainted with. Um, just because, you know, like I said, I, I've been I've been down in the dumps in ministry and quite frankly, hated, hated ministry. Uh, but, you know, it's it's just one of those things where God has always been able to put me into a situation or has reminded me that this is where I to be. And I truly love being in ministry, but I sometimes truly don't love the uh, um, the fears and the doubts and, and the stuff that I let the world that I let get in the way of me and my um, call, call to ministry. Yeah, I felt that a lot when I was starting out in youth ministry because I went directly from being a high schooler to being a youth leader. And a lot of times they don't recommend you do that. And the main reason is because, one, you have no idea what you're doing. And two, because everyone else that you were in high school with is not going to see you as a leader. And both of those were very true. And so I remember starting out and I was youth president. I was like the, the NYI president and uh, and our our youth pastor had just left and I was thinking, okay, now I guess this is kind of on me. And uh, so the senior pastor stepped in and he took both roles. He was senior pastor and youth pastor, which I have no idea how he had the energy to do both, but that was just kind of his decision was to do both in the, in the meantime, while we were looking for a new one. And it was very evident that I had no idea what was going on. I mean, I was trying my best. But there was just a lot of days that I'd go home and I would have a lot of doubt. And I think this is not working. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's going on. Well, and then that's how we got, um, that's how we got Josh was eventually, he came a couple of years later, we interviewed him and he accepted. And so we had a new youth pastor and it was like a, uh, it was like a sigh of relief for me. I was like, oh, thank goodness. I don't have to worry about this anymore. Um, and over time though, when he started giving me more and more responsibilities and even came a time where. Uh, the senior pastor left. So then he became the interim senior pastor. And then I just became the interim youth pastor. And that was, talk about doubts. I mean, talk about fears and talk about like, I am now responsible for these teens. Like this is now all on me Sunday mornings and the Thursday evenings that we were meeting, like any fundraisers, any events, like all this is now on me to to create this culture of growth for these teens. And I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm not even a pastor at this point. Like I hadn't even gotten, I wasn't credentialed. I'd gotten locally licensed with the church, but I hadn't been district licensed or anything else. And I was just, I was just full of those, of those, of those doubts that you talk about and not knowing what to do. But yeah, I, I just going through that verse again, like you said, especially the part says like, we have these things because we know him. You know, we have, we can have the confidence, we can have the love and the patience and all the attributes of the Holy Spirit and all of the goodness of God just by knowing him, just by staying in connection with him. I think that is, that was definitely true then because it wasn't on me. If I did a good job and people thought that I did, did a good job, that was not because I was this genius of a youth pastor. That was definitely <laughs> just because I was praying a, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, we also have to kind of get past that stigma, like <clears throat> trying to fill your mentor's shoes, you know, because you're not trying to fill their shoes. You're not trying to walk the same path. That, well, you're walking the same path, but you're not walking in the same footsteps as them, you know. Like everybody asks me, you know, they're like, are you trying to, you know, be your dad? Are you trying to fill your dad's shoes? And I'm like, no. Of course, he is a great leader and a great mentor, sure. But I'm not trying to be just like him. I have a different way of expressing how I interpret things. And, you know, there's no wrong, there is a wrong way to interpret the Bible, but there are different ways to as well. So, right. um, you know, like with Josh, Josh was, Josh was a great human being. He DJed my wedding. So I <laughs> mad love for that guy. Um, he, uh, you know, so I, I get that where you're like, I just watched you do this incredible thing and now I have to try to be, do what you did and, you know, make, keep, keep it going. And it's like, that's great, but you don't, you can do that without, you know, trying to walk in the same footprints as he did. Right. right. <clears throat> you know, it's fun because um, I don't know. Did you guys get to meet Stephen, my, my friend? 
briefly. Uh, Pastor, Pastor Steve, okay. Uh, well, I took his place um, at, at Northwest Church of the Nazarene in Columbus, and uh, I was wet behind the ears. Now, I had been in youth ministries and helped out with other youth ministries, but to go from uh, you know, him as my mentor to him taking another job at another church. And then all of a sudden it's just me. I'm like, Oh no, I didn't learn very much. And I, I you know, I, there's times where I would sit there and I'd be giving the, the lesson or the, the little sermon. And I'm like, okay, guys, does anybody have any questions? And then, you know, you get no, nobody wants to, you know, raise their hand. And it, it seems like nobody's paying attention. And it's Those like, are fun. Yeah, that kind of thing, like, it be, those things, like, I used to let beat me up a little bit, but, you know, what was really cool was when, uh, when I took the position here, um, I, you know, I had, I got to talk to my kids, and I just, you know, I, they really made me feel pretty good when they're like, we love, you know, we loved your, your preaching style, we had so much fun with you, um, a, one of the girls was like, Lewis, um, I think, you know, you helped me out so much. And I think my call is to be in ministry. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's so great. And you know, it, we, I think we want instant, even as pastors, I know um, this is going to, this is going to sound bad, but there, there's these instant gratifications that we, we as humans want. And uh, you know, for me, it was like, I want to know, I want to know that my, my kids are learning or that my people are picking up on this. And, you know, sometimes it does, it's not instant. Like this isn't a, an instant gratification, uh, job field. And we just have to remember and learn that, um, or learn and remember that. But, uh, you know, I, there was, like I said, just those times where I'm like, am I even getting through to these kids? And, um, you know, time and patience and, you know, it, you really are like, no matter what you really are. It's just this, like I said earlier, and I'll, I'll continue saying this for the rest of my life. It's just, you know, it takes one seed it, and that seed will, you know, grow. Some seeds grow, uh, like in, like in real, the real, real life, uh, certain plants grow at certain rates and, um, it's this, it's the same when it comes to, you know, spiritual growth. I would love to say that I went to church one time and all of a sudden I was Lewis Wysinski, this super Christian, but that's not true. <laughs> I went to church and, uh, the seed was planted and years and years and years and years later and lots of years of running from God and, and running from the call. I finally, uh, I finally sprouted, you know, them. Christians, pastors, we're all still learning. Um, we just have to, you know, take what we learn and, and, and build off of that and pray about that and just, you know, have fun with Christianity. It's, a, it's fun. We're a fun group. Um, you know, we just have to remember that uh, all, all of our Christian life should be a life of growth. That is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I think Peter puts it perfect here. You know, just the whole thing where, you know, he says, "Hold on, let me open it back up." I had it, and then as my phone locked, it says, "Make every effort to confirm your calling and election, for if you do these things, you will never stumble." Yeah. Yeah. So that's. I mean, that's it. That's it. Mic drop by Peter. So, <laughs> you know, they, it's, it's important. It's important to continue to want to grow, to continue to, you know, trying to put it into words here. And it's not working. My brain is like farting at the moment. <laughs> um, I feel it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Lewis, you said it perfectly. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to add on to that. The, I mean, just see now I'm, I'm doing it too. Um, just, just the, the, the spirit <laughs> of trying to do right by people and do right by God. And I think that, I think combined kind of like you said with the, with taking over uh, Steve's shoes and 
being this leader of everybody. Yeah, I, I definitely related to all of that where you're talking about like, oh, it was so disheartening when you had a question or you were asking, does anybody have any questions? And everyone's just kind of sitting there looking at the ground or at each other or at their phones. And you're thinking, what am I doing here? What is even the point of tonight? I guess like I was just talking for nothing. So I, I definitely remember so many of those nights where I'm like, am I doing anything? Is, is this really working at all? And I remember a story that my uncle told me where he had a, he had a service and it was a, it was a Sunday night service, but the only people that were coming were, it was just a handful of people. And it used to be the entire church would come, but now it's just a handful of people. And it seemed as though he said every week it was less and less and less and less. But of those small handful of people, they, they demanded there has to be a Sunday night service. There absolutely has to be. And for no other reason than just that there has to be. And so he, I went to go visit him one time. And so I sat in the service during his Sunday evening service. And I'm looking around and these people were like falling asleep. It's like they, they were so <laughs> demanding that there had to be a Sunday night service, but they were not even paying attention. They were falling asleep. It was just like, it was, it was just such a, it was, it was such a perfect picture of going through the motions. And right. uh, afterwards, my, I, my uncle said, so what do you think? I said, is that how it always is? Cause wow, <laughs> this is like, so I think I was like 22 at the time. I'm like, is, is it always like that? Cause that was, it didn't seem like anyone really wanted to be there. Honestly, it's like, I'm sorry. It's not <laughs> anything against you <laughs> or against your preaching, but it just didn't seem like anyone really wanted to be there. He goes, yeah, but they demand I have one. He said, I was honestly so close to just saying, are we having fun folks? Should we just go get ice cream and celebrate the end of Sunday night service? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I think so many times in ministry, we get to those points where we don't know if what we're doing is effective. But there are definitely times like obviously that was an instance where it didn't seem like it was going anywhere, not because of the pastor's part, but just because it didn't seem like anyone wanted to really be a part of it. But there are so many other times where we think something isn't effective and it really is. And I think being authentic yeah. is the most effective thing that we can do in a church is being who we are just as people. And then, yeah, people get to know us. Oh, yeah, you're a pastor. Or, oh, yeah, you're a Christian. But they still know that, yep, I still got my own skeletons. I still got my own things I'm trying to overcome. Believe me, I'm not perfect. I'm not always Mr. Confident. I don't think that I have the best voice. I don't think that I have the best speech. I don't think my sermons are the greatest. You know, I don't think that I'm the best example of what it means to be a Christian out in this world. But I am doing the best that I can, and I want to grow. And that's my mission is to keep growing. So if you want to be my friend right. and hang out with me, cool. Let's hang out. Just know that don't ever think that I'm thinking of myself as better than you or that I have it all together because I really don't. <laughs> and anyone who tells you otherwise is lying to you. Right. Well, that's funny that you bring that up because I used to be a part of a lot of like Christian blog forums and stuff. And the, t the, the topic of tattoos was brought up once. Oh, boy. Um, and if you're listening and you don't know me, I have tattoos and a good amount of them. I'm not, I'm not covered in them, but, um, uh, I, you know, somebody once said, Oh, tattoos are a sin. And they go to, you know, they go to Leviticus and, and that's, you know, that's always the one. Yeah, it but is. I said, Leviticus, so is, <laughs> Leviticus is the perfect book to go to, to accuse people of things. <laughs> But I, you know, sat there and I was like, I'm going to have to humbly disagree with you that we're all, you know, all of us tattooed people are going to hell. I was like, well, um, and this is, a, this is, this was years ago. So I was in seminary. I was like, I'm actually working on becoming, you know, a, a fully ordained uh, pastor and all of this other stuff. And I consider myself to be a, a fairly godly person. And this lady just drove into me about how I, how I was not fit to be a pastor, how I could never, ever speak the word of God uh, and be honest about it. And all, she just went on and on and on. And it was like, oh, wow. <laughs> so th this is <laughs> and uh, she, I, I was like, well, and, you know, and I was very calm. And I, I said, well, I'm still going to have to disagree with you. And then she got me, she got me kicked off the, 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 the forum. Uh yes. And I quote harassment <laughs> for harass for saying I disagree with you. Yeah, <laughs> but I, you know, and, and for the hypocritical Christians that give all of us a bad name, right? 
Right. So I mean, she, she started to laugh at Hubert. <laughs> yeah, apparently she was a grace of God thing, but no, I shouldn't say that. She, you know, and, and everybody's allowed to have their opinions or, or however they read the Bible. But, the, you know, when it, when it comes down to it, it really just boils down to um, I'm not perfect. She's not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But with the grace of God, we're saved. And if we truly believe and put our hearts in that grace of God and, and put our hearts in Christ and allow Christ to live through us, that's, I mean, I, I just summed up the Bible in two sentences, <laughs> you know, but we have, we have to do that. We have, you know, and, and she, she was, she was angry. I don't know what in her past made her angry, but you know, um, uh, you know, I prayed for her for a while after that, and I'll continue continue to pray for her and hope that she uh, um, opens her eyes and her mind uh, to what, you know, God has done for a lot of people who have tattoos and piercings and all that fun stuff. <laughs> right, yeah. I, I remember talking with a lady like that in Seattle. It was just a lady at a bus stop, and she just, someone walked by who had a, one tattoo on their arm, and she looks at me and goes, "Ugh, don't you just don't you just think that that's just so terrible of people?" And I was just <laughs> I, I had no idea what she was referring to at the time, so I was just like, "What? What do you mean? What happened?" And she said, "That that girl with that tattoo on her arm. Ugh, what a what a shame. Her parents must be so embarrassed." And we just like launched into this whole conversation of like, "Why would her parents be embarrassed of of a tattoo? I don't understand." And she was just trying to tell me about how awful and everything it was. And yeah, she did the same thing, quoting Leviticus. And I call I call Deuteronomy and Leviticus the finger pointers Bible because it's usually the the go to books that people use to point the fingers at other people to make them feel guilty for how they live their lives. Um, yeah. But that's just kind of <laughs> that's where she was going with it too. And I was just trying to talk to her. I was like, you know, people can do what they want to do, and it doesn't make it different. Like just because they have a tattoo it doesn't take away your voice and your authority to speak on a subject like that's just ridiculous yeah but i think uh when it comes to leviticus it's the one book that most people and i will use quotation i'm air quoting right now just read so they they just read but they don't you know they'll read one part but not the parts before it or after it or they'll right. remember one part, sorry they'll remember one part but not the parts before it and after it um yeah, I'm not supposed to mark up my body with the 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 symbols of my pagan gods, you know. But <laughs> so it's like, right. I mean, look, um, it, is my is my physical body going to heaven when I die? Absolutely not. My spirit is. I don't think my spirit's tattooed. Although that would be pretty cool. I would pick different tattoos That'd for be my so spirit. sweet. <laughs> <laughs> But then, then, you know, people are like, uh, they'll, they'll use tattoos as the, the mark of the devil. And all that. I'm like, oh, geez. <laughs> so, sorry that my... Unless my, you have uh, a literal tattoo of the devil, it's not the mark of the devil. Right. <laughs> or you have like a pentagram tattooed on you, you know, it's like, you know, go back to that what everybody says in every body is a temple. Right. Okay, well, most temples are inscribed with things. Most mm -hmm. temples have you know have markings on their wall yeah so, so you don't walk is... into a temple and there's nothing on it so honestly <laughs> the con... temple is the shell of a building right that's yeah so true and it's honestly almost like a controversial statement to say like when we have crosses hanging up in the in the walls of our churches like are those not symbols as well and we're supposed to be worshiping God, not a symbol. So it's almost as if if the devotion is more towards a symbol, regardless of what it is, then where's your real alliance? Right. Well, yeah, you can find hypocrisy in everything. Oh yeah. In everything. Oh, absolutely. You know, that's, that's that's that's. I mean, that's that's the main reason why people what people have against Christians. You know, they're like, oh well, you're a hypocrite. It's like <laughs> you're okay. describing the human um, race. That's fine. Oh. Right, right. Everybody's hypocritical in their own right. You know, you know, we, you know. We can't we we worship a symbol sometimes, but that symbol is it symbolizes what we're actually there for. And so I, I don't know. We go around and around with it. Right. 
which we don't need to. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting to see how things develop, like with the way society sees the church and way the church sees society, and it's like they just go back and forth on each other, pointing the finger at each other for doing doing wrong, instead of actually working with each other to make things better. It's just a competition of. Well, I can make you seem more wrong than you've made me seem wrong. Right. Well, fi- finding the wrong in people happens to be just so much easier uh, than finding the good in people. <laughs> but going well, back to what Kendra was saying, um, I read this really great story about this girl who was a, a devil worshiper, whatever branch that she was in. But she had a tattoo, big tattoo, too. Um, actually, really nicely done if you can say that about a big devil tattoo, but she, <laughs> she just, um, it was like the upside down pentagram, um, goat's head, uh, deal. I'm oh, sure we've yeah. all yep. talked about, but she had that done on her arm and then she met Jesus and gave her life to Christ. Um, she was very conflicted on whether or not she should have it removed or covered up. But for some reason, like, so I don't know the exact reason why she kept it, but she's actually been able to use this tattoo uh, for the she would uh, hang out with, the people she would meet. Um, it gave a, a really good talking point for her. And she says, you know, she would sit there and say, oh, yeah, this is uh, from when I believed in this system or when I followed this system. But she, she would say, but now I gave my life to Christ. And then she would say why she gave her life to Christ. So she was able to use this ta- that tattoo to her advantage and to the advantage of the kingdom. Um, you know, I think, you know, a, some ink, no matter what it is on your body, um, is never going to be able to take the place of God. And God was uh, is able to work through her and uh, use the tattoo to her advantage. So I think that was that's really great. Um, I, I, you know, I'm not going to have the same results with a uh, a straight laced uh, Anglo Saxon uh, person uh, with no tattoos as I would somebody with tattoos. You know, somebody would look at me and be like, "Oh, dude, you're you're a pastor." All the time that happens. Oh, yeah, I, I would never have guessed. Yeah, you're right. You never would have guessed. <laughs> you know, but I am, and this is what I'm, I stand for. And this is what my, God has put on my heart. And he told, you know, let's talk about it if you want. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's worked. I hate to say that it's a, uh, uh, it's worked to my advantage, but it's a tool and it's something that I can use to get in uh, people's lives on a more personal level. And that's, you know, that's the ultimate goal, I guess. <laughs> Well, I love that we can use tools like that to bring people to a different perspective of what Christianity is. And that's the awesome part about us having all different backgrounds and all different likes and interests and hobbies is because we can relate to people that somebody else who isn't interested in that particular hobby or interest uh, could ever do. You know, we can right. speak we can speak to different people and that's the best way that we can reach is not all by looking at the same cookie cutter approach, which I remember in the early 2000s, there was a lot of this approach going around from different churches that there was a, a formula for how to save somebody. And they wanted to follow, they wanted you to follow this formula exactly. And everybody should do it. And everyone should follow this exact formula of how to, how to get people saved. And of course, it didn't really work that well because even the people, a lot of the people that said that they were saved or became Christians because of that formula, they eventually just gave up because once they were in, it was like the church just kind of forgot about them. And we're like, okay, cool. We got another person in. All right, move on. And then that person had a lot of questions and never got to have them answered. But to talk about the positive side of things too, just so we have a balance. uh, Once (laughs) once people kind of realized that that was just not the way to do things and started to live more authentically, I started to meet more and more Christians who were just authentic about, hey, yeah, I like this thing. And I know it's not stereotypically a Christian thing to do, but so what? You need to let go of stereotypes and open your mind up to the fact that not everyone looks the same and not everyone follows God the same way. And we're all convicted differently. And as long as what I am doing is not against the Bible, then there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. So come have fun with me. And so I, I like that the, the church kind of came out of that and just realized, no, 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 no. We need to get away from this formula. We need to get away from making everybody a robot and 
allow people to express themselves and express their Christianity uniquely through their own personalities. Right, exactly. My uncle always had this saying about when he would meet with other pastors of different denominations in his area, they would get together for lunch and they'd just talk about things like not necessarily bragging about, well, what, what's your church doing that's better than any other church or anything like that, but it was just asking, you know, what's good, what's bad, and supporting each other. And their whole phrase, their whole, I guess, motto or vision statement was, what unites us is stronger than what divides us. And I've always loved using that in both inside and outside of the church, that what unites us is stronger than what divides us. We can choose to focus on the things that we love to talk about that cause all the, all the hate between different belief systems. You know, you are of the different political parties. So I think that you're a danger to the country or you're of this mindset. So I think you should just be quiet because you clearly don't know what you're talking about, whatever it is. There's all these ideas that we can focus on that stuff or we can focus on what actually makes us better as people and then also what makes us better as a church. And I think uh, kind of to Kendra's point that she's made several times now um, that the church is killing it. The church is killing it in this regard of how we're responding to this pandemic and how we're responding to people who are in need that we are showing what unites us is stronger. Killing it. (laughs) <laughs> I was wondering, I was like, Kinder, are you still there? <laughs> yeah, you know, I was on mute, so it takes me a second to have to reply because i got to unmute it. But, well, you know, when it comes to the call and when it comes to doing any of your, uh, um, whatever God tells you to do and going out to people and whether or not you have tattoos and all of this other stuff, we, like, I'm going to go right into Isaiah 44. Uh, where, you know, it talks about the idol and stuff like that. And, and, and you know, we, we have to remember as, as Christians, and you had mentioned having the cross and, and you know, you have the, the pagan, you know, cows and whatnot. Um, we just have to remember as Christians as, yes, these, these are all tools. Somebody might see my cross around my neck that I've worn for years and years and years and years now or my what would Jesus do bracelet, or whatever. I wear an ichthus around my left hand. But it's like, you know, these are all symbols, uh, you know, of my love and devotion to God, but they're definitely not to be used as an idol. Um, right. We, But they're, you know, idols aren't necessarily just the things that are physically in front of us. Um, you you can, a hatred, hatred is a, an awful idol, that people will put before God. Um, you know, if you, if you hate, you've already committed murder. I mean, but we, we have to let the things that are worldly um, out of our, out of our sight. It's like that stuff shouldn't even be on our pathway to the Lord. Um, but we, we often get into this mindset or we let things get in our way of living a hundred percent, whole life of holiness a holy life and we in the nazarene church really really promote you know holiness and but we have to you know i have to like i said in the last podcast i have to think about what did jesus christ do uh when this came about or how would jesus christ uh react if this was presented to him and we just have to take the, the idols of our life, and every one of us has them, and every Christian has them, whether he or she wants to admit it or not. We have these things in our life that we will put in front of God, and we should actually hand them to God, whether it's a, you know, depression. Depression can be a bad thing um, where we, we focus on our depression but not focus on God. Uh, or, you know, uh, people who... Uh, value their worldly possessions more than they do their their uh, Christendom, you know. But it's just one of those things where we have to put Christ first, no matter what. Um, and it's not always easy, but we have to remember to do that. Completely agree. I love that. It's also important to um, separate them. You know, as long as that, as long as, because like you said, everybody has idols. 
um, as long as that idol isn't getting in the way of your relationship with Christ, then it shouldn't matter, you know. So, because I was telling Stephen when we, when Pastor David did a full sermon on false idols, you know, like I, I'm obsessed with Harry Potter. I have a room in my house dedicated just to Harry Potter, <laughs> you know. But I don't, I don't, I don't let my love of Harry Potter. I, they're two separate things to me, my Christianity and my love of Christ and my love of Harry Potter. They're two separate things. And my, my love of Jesus Christ is always number one, always number one, regardless of my shrine to Harry Potter. So shrine. I think that's important too. Yeah, if we, if we let our devotion to really anything in this world, I mean, if we let our focus shift, and that was something that my... Um, one of my youth pastors taught was about focus and where is your focus? You know, check your focus before you do something. So you think that it's a good idea to talk to someone or to share this verse with somebody. Maybe you just need to sit and listen. You know, maybe it's not so much that you need to rush in with a bunch of words and a bunch of speeches trying to encourage them. Maybe they just need you to sit down and share a cup of coffee with them and listen to their problems and let them vent because honestly, sometimes venting is all you need to get through a situation. You just need somebody to just listen to how angry you are at the world for them to think, okay, all right, I can handle this. I just needed a release. And so with as, as being a Christian, if you're not checking your focus on how you're, before you, know, before you speak, before you do something, if you're doing it for your own glory, if you're doing it for your own benefit, if you're doing it for any other reason other than serving God, serving people, loving your neighbor as yourself, if you're doing it for a different reason other than that, then you need to stop and, and think, why is it that you're trying to make your name so great? Or why is it that you're trying to do something that you shouldn't be doing if it's about your name when ultimately it is about God's name? This whole story of life, this whole story of humanity, however long you want to believe that the universe has been in existence, whether you want to think it's 60,000 years or 13.8 billion, all of it is about God. And that should be our entire life goal. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. <clears throat> but, you know, in, in, in today's world and society, it's, it's, it's just easy to push that goal aside. It's oh, yeah. easy to put something in front of God. It, I mean, and I'm not saying that may, it's just because it's easy doesn't make it right. But, you know, it's, it's just something that we... Um, as Christians need to, um, I guess, realize um, when it comes to, to our belief system, like we, we, we might have this thing going on in our life and it might be good. It might be bad. There might be, you know, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be only bad things that get in the way of God. It could be great things that get in the way of mm -hmm. God, but we have to be, we have to put God in those things. Um like I, like I said, uh, there's times where, you know, I don't necessarily feel like the greatest, you know, pastor in the whole world. So then I let that self-doubt and, and discouragement uh, get in the way of my, my true calling, my, my, my life with God. So, it's, you know, like, it's, I mean, sin, um, you know, sin, sin is a super bad idol that we, we will, you know, uh, put in the way of God. Uh, you know, we'll be a sinner and then we'll continue to sin and then we'll just live off of that sin. And we just have to, we have to give our whole, our whole hearts to God and just let him take care of, you know, everything uh, that is uh, obstructing our life with him. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I didn't have anything else to add to that either. So I was just waiting to see if Kendra had nope. something. <laughs> nope, I, I agree. And he said it perfectly. And Honestly, I think that's a great note to end on. Is that, you know what? If you feel like something is getting in the way of your Christianity, then reevaluate it and put God first. And I know it's not that easy. I know it's not. I know it's not easy from personal experience. And I think everybody has this problem. You know, where they're like, ah, they don't. They don't. They don't even think about God when they just decide to do it. You know. So it's. Mm -hmm. It's hard, but you gotta. It's, I mean, just like you train yourself to not bite your nails, you know, you train yourself to not drink alcohol anymore. It's the exact same thing. You do it. You train yourself to always put God first. And I say train is probably not the best word, but I can't think of a better one right now. But, oh, that works. Um, 
Yeah. So, I mean, cause that's, that's all it is. You know, we, we decide as, as, a, as individuals that we are going to put Christ above everything. And it, it, it's not, it's not as easy as just saying it. You have to put it in the practice. Right. Yep. That's, that's, that's exactly right. Well, cool. I know um, it is. Thank you. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, right. that's well, awesome. I, I'm, I'm, I don't have anything else to add if you guys are done. Nope. I think that's it. I think I think we do just a really – this was an awesome podcast. I honestly lost track of time. I didn't even realize it. we've been – it's 57 minutes in. I didn't even realize that. So – um, yeah, no, trying to keep it at the 45 minute mark for this thing because I know that people <laughs> sometimes don't like to listen that much. But, Lewis, I really hope that you come and join us again soon. Oh, I will. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we because will. I think that this has been amazing. Yeah, and I'm loving this new format, this way that we're going. I think it, it really helps. So, really excited for how that's mm-hmm. how that's played out. So awesome! Um, if you guys want to read, you listeners is how who I'm talking to now. If you want to read these verses on your own, again, it is Isaiah chapter six verses one through eleven, or you can just do the entire chapter um, because it's also amazing. If you just do the entire chapter, it's not even that much longer than verse eleven. I think it's only eighteen verses, something like that. Um, and then there's also Isaiah chapter forty four verses six through eight and fourteen through twenty, and then the final one is Second Peter. Chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. So check out these verses and research them on your own. Let us know what you think. Let each other know what you think. Join us for all of our Zoom meetings, all of our Facebook meetings, and just stay a part of the church and uh, stay active in getting rid of this pandemic and getting rid of the virus and be, you know, wash your hands and be safe, but also be encouraging to each other through all this time. And you know, we're really excited to come out of this and we're really excited to hit the ground running and just be the church in every way, shape, and form. Amen to that. Yep. And as as both Lewis right, and Kendra have said, you. oh, sorry, you're doing your closing. No, nope, no, nope, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, as Lewis and Kendra have said, they are going to hug you when this is over. So just be ready for that. There's going to be a lot of hugs. <laughs> All of the hugs will be had. <laughs> okay now do it do your closing okay uh, all right everybody well yeah this is a bonus episode you get it you get two episodes this week uh we'll see you again with a uh, papa david message on this sunday which is today um and i hope everybody has a great week and hopefully everybody's getting through this so personal love everybody